So, good afternoon, everybody. We're gonna start. Actually, we are starting. So my name is Jessica Roda. I am an assistant professor in the Center for Jewish Civilization. And this afternoon, we thought that we will take a brief moment to tell you a little bit about the work of the center before introducing our keynote. So the CJC was founded in 2003, but then it was known as the Program for Jewish Civilization. On February 29 of 2016, after 13 long years of scholarship, teaching, and intensive fundraising, it became the Center for Jewish Civilization, or the CJC. Our unit boasts 100 students who receive either a certificate or a minor in our program. Our faculty is composed of 22 scholars and scholar practitioners, folks such as ambassadors, Dennis Ross, Tamara Kaufman Wittes of the Brookings Institution, former Deputy National Security Advisor Elliot Abrams, former Israeli Ambassador to the Holy See Zion Evroni, and former Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom Rabbi David Saperstein. I am myself the newest addition to the Center for Jewish Civilization. Our unit specializes in American Middle Eastern foreign policy as it pertains to Israel, but also Jewish American literature, cinema, music, and culture, Jewish Catholic and Jewish Muslim relations, and of course, Holocaust and uh, genocide studies. Our assistant director you shall meet later is Ara Foreman, he's present with us now, and you will also meet our associate director, Dr. Anna Sommer, and our dear director, Jacques Berlinablo, who is over there. So we are very proud of the work that we have accomplished, and we invite you to check our website, cjc.georgetown.edu, or follow us on Twitter at cjc underscore info. Now I would like to welcome our keynote address. And today we have a very special guest who will share her expertise pertaining to an issue of great relevance to the subject we are discussing today. She will be speaking about confronting 21st century white nationalism, a topic that she has been extremely involved in. So Christine Clark, Christine Clark serves as the president and executive director of the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. She formerly served as the head of the Civil Rights Bureau for the New York State Attorney's General's Office, <laughs> where she led broad civil rights enforcement on matters such as criminal justice, education, housing discrimination, voting rights, and immigration rights, among others. Under her leadership, the Bureau secured landmark agreements with banks to address unlawful riddling, with employers to address barriers to societal reentry for people with criminal backgrounds, with police departments on reforms to policies, and with major retailers on racial profiling of consumers, and with one of the country's largest school districts relating to the school to prison pipeline. Her most recent awards include the 2018 Louis Reading Lifetime Achievement Award and 2018 Harvard College Service to Society Award. She most recently worked to get Facebook to change their policies on banning hate speech and just yesterday she testified before the House Judiciary Committee about hate crimes and the rise of white nationalism. So please join me to welcoming Christian Clark. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for that very gracious introduction and thank you to the Center for uh, Jewish Civilization for the invitation to speak today on a topic that's incredibly timely and important. And um, before I get started, I just wanna recognize a few colleagues who are with me today. Um, Isabella Cress-Nash, Sarah Gibson, and Reynolds Graves. 
and uh, also wanted to recognize my uh, partner and professor of history at Georgetown University, Mustafa Aksakal. Um, as we continue to witness the rise in racial violence, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, homophobia, and more, it's critical that we understand the roots of this crisis and use this foundation to identify effective strategies for combating the scourge of hate that we face today. From nooses that are being hung in the workplace to hijabs that are being pulled from women's heads to swastikas sprayed on bathroom walls to slurs and epithets hurled at students of color to burning churches and massacres inside houses of worship. We know that hate is not a thing of the past, but a crisis that sadly defines where we are in America today. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law is a national civil rights organization created at the request of President John F. Kennedy in 1963. Kennedy convened a meeting at the White House with more than 200 private lawyers, and his charge to them was to return to their home communities, roll up their sleeves, and figure out how they could use the law to come to the aid of victims of discrimination. And many of them did just that. They went back to their home communities and started to take on cases protecting the First Amendment rights of people engaged in sit-ins and uh, those marching for the right to vote and more. Um, and I'd like to share that history because it very much defines who we are as an organization in the civil rights landscape today. We are an organization that is about engaging uh, law firms in carrying out our work across the country and partnering with them to combat hate crimes is a top priority for us today. Um, indeed, our work to combat hate crimes and white supremacy stands among our most important work uh, right now. Through our Stop Hate Project, we lead one of the most robust anti-hate and anti-extremism projects in the country. We connect with survivors by way of an 844-9-NO-HATE hotline. We train law enforcement and prosecutors through a unique partnership with the International Association of Chiefs of Police. We push for reform in the tech sector, and we also use the courts to hold white supremacists accountable. Um, confronting hate is something that, sadly, we do every day. And we do this knowing that hate crimes are not new, and carry out our work with great sensitivity to our nation's dark and sordid history of racial violence. We know that white nationalism is white supremacy. And indeed, white supremacy has been a persistent threat to the democratic ideals that our country has strived for since its founding. African Americans in particular have experienced generations of racial terror from the moment that the first slaves were brought to our shores 400 years ago. Frederick Douglass's writings provide a stark illustration of the dehumanization that slaves endured. And I want to share some of his words. Frequently before the child has reached its 12th month, its mother is taken from it and hired out on some farm a considerable distance off. And the child is placed under the care of an old woman, too old for field labor. For what this separation is done, I do not know, unless it is to hinder the development of the child's affection towards its mother and to blunt and destroy the natural affection of the mother for the child. This is the inevitable result. As I reflect on Douglas's words, I think about our administration's use of forcible separation of children from their parents as a punitive measure at the border today. This dehumanization carries through the post-Reconstruction era and from Jim Crow all the way through the Civil Rights Movement. Between 1882 and 1968, there were over 4,743 recorded lynchings in the United States, and the majority of the victims were black. Black women were not immune. Walter White of the NAACP was often deployed to the South to investigate lynchings and did so throughout the 1900s. Um, he invested, uh, investigated one lynching, in particular of Mary Turner, of Brooks Lowndes County, Georgia. 
Abusive plantation owner Hampton Smith was, uh, Smith was shot and killed. A week-long manhunt resulted in the killing of the husband of Mary Turner, um, Hayes Turner. Mary Turner denied that her husband had been involved in the killing of Smith. Nonetheless, on May 19th, uh, in the early 1900s, a mob of several hundred took her to the Folsom Bridge on the county line. The mob tied her ankles, hung her upside down from a tree, doused her in gasoline and motor oil, and set her on fire. Turner was still alive when a member of the mob uh, the mob split her abdomen open with a knife and her unborn child fell on the ground. The baby was stomped and crushed as it fell on the ground. Turner's body was riddled with hundreds of bullets. This legacy of racial violence still lies deep within the DNA of our nation. Since the FBI began publishing data on hate crimes in 1995, African Americans remain the single group most frequently targeted for hate. Indeed, the latest FBI data shows a 17% increase between 2016 and 2017. This increase, among other tensions, has led to unimaginable tragedy for communities here and across the globe. One of the most vivid and recent examples of racial violence captured in the very early set of that FBI data is the 1998 murder of James Byrd in Jasper, Texas. On a Saturday night, three white men were driving around Jasper, including two avowed white supremacists. James Byrd was walking home after drinking with friends when the driver of the truck offered him a ride. At some point, the three white men attacked Mr. Byrd, spray painted his face, used the chain to tie him to the rear bumper of their truck, and then drove along an isolated path filled with th uh, thick pine and sweet gum trees. And they did so for three miles, dragging him uh, behind. His naked body was found in the front of a black cemetery just outside Jasper. He was decapitated and dismembered. His brutal murder followed the murder of Matthew Shepard, who was targeted on the basis of his sexual orientation. And these tragedies propelled Congress to eventually pass the 2009 Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Hate Crimes Prevention Act, important tools in the arsenal of our federal government in combating hate crimes today. It's important that we not forget that no site is immune from these tragedies and that violence towards racial and religious minorities has played out even inside our houses of worship. Just last month, two consecutive attacks on mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand claimed the lives of 50. We all remain haunted by the 11 worshipers who were killed in Pittsburgh last October. Uh, the Tree of Life Synagogue shooting invoked painful memories of the 2015 church shooting where a white supremacist killed nine African-American worshipers at the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. And the Charleston shooting um, invokes memories of four young girls who were murdered at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama on September 15, 1963 a cowardly act of white supremacist terrorism. While separated apart in time, these attacks highlight the consistent, long, bitter hatred that African Americans and other vulnerable communities have faced even inside houses of worship. It's important that we never normalize racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, or any dangerous ideology uh, that's frankly left a dark stain on the soul of our democracy. Three weeks after the 16th Street Baptist Church massacre, um, Dr. King visited the church for the eulogy for the four young girls. He looked out into the crowd of heartbroken congregants and bereaving parents and observed these children, unoffending, innocent, and beautiful, were the victims of one of the most vicious and tragic crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. In a real sense, they have something to, something to say to each of us in their death. They say to each of us, black, 
and white alike that we must substitute courage for caution. They say to us that we must be concerned not merely about who murdered them, but about the system, the way of life, the philosophy which produced these murders. Their death says to us that we must work passionately and unrelentingly for the rea realization of the American dream. His words ring powerful today. Former Attorney General Lynch visited the church in 2015 and remarked that hate crimes are the original domestic terrorism. In, 1993, in 1996, Congress patched, uh, passed the Church Arson Prevention Act, which makes it a crime to deface, damage, or destroy religious property or interfere with someone's religious practice. Um, we will be looking closely to see what the administration does as we watch three black churches that are burning uh, in Louisiana. We've got to count on our federal government to step up during moments like this to hold the perpetrators accountable. Let me talk a little bit about what we as civil rights lawyers are doing to contend with the crisis that we face. In an ideal world, every criminal prosecutor would be making fighting hi a hate crime uh, their top priority. But we know that that's not the case, sadly, and so we're stepping in to fill the void. And we're finding unique ways to use the existing tools that we have in our arsenal to hold white supremacists accountable. In March 2017, the Student Government Association at American University, right next door, voted in a new student president, a young African-American woman named Taylor Johnson. On her first day in office, she was the target of racially motivated hate by white supremacists. Banana peels and nooses were hung around campus, uh, hung around campus with um, hateful and offensive messages, uh, some that referenced um, Ms. Dumpson's black sorority, others that compared her to a gorilla and other African Americans to gorillas. Um, she endured relentless hate. Um, she was doxxed, her personal information was published online, and a website called the Daily Stormer instructed their followers to go out and attack and harass her. She suffered emotionally, her grades took a hit, but she didn't cower in fear. We partnered with her and filed a lawsuit on her behalf against the publisher of the Daily Stormer and several other defendants. And just this past December, we secured an agreement with one of the named defendants that requires that he renounce white supremacy, that he provide cooperation to us in our efforts to hold other white supremacists accountable, issue an apology to Ms. Dumpson, uh, complete community service, among other remedial action. We're very proud of this outcome. What else are we doing? We're also working with law enforcement and prosecutors to help them enhance and strengthen their approach to this work. As civil rights lawyers, we realize that we need law enforcement at the table if we're gonna ever overcome the crisis that we face. We forged a unique partnership with the International Association of Chiefs of Police and just this past Monday published a report outlining best practices for helping law enforcement agencies all across our country better confront hate. And we're also working to address the crisis of hate online. Uh, no doubt white nationalists are using online platforms to recruit new members, to activate followers, to target communities, to um, target victims, to organize hate rallies, to incite violence, and much, much more. Instead of hiding under hoods, they are now organizing behind computer screens. They've sought to rebrand themselves, employing new labels to try and become more palatable to broad, uh, broader audiences, but regardless of what you call them, white nationalists, the alt-right, neo-Nazis, the KKK, Proud Boys, they all pose the same dangerous threat today. To this end, um, we've taken action to shut down some of the biggest hate websites um, that we face today. Um, Stormfront is one of the world's largest hate sites. It's over 25 years old. They have millions of site visitors from across the globe each year and hundreds of thousands of registered users. And um, 
and we shut them down. And we shut them down through a creative strategy of going after the web host companies. Um, many of these companies, like Network Solution, have terms of service agreements that consumers agree to when they buy their services. And Network Solutions uh, had a terms of service agreement that said you can't use our services to promote and incite violence. And we were able to provide a list of 12 murders that had happened that were directly traceable to activity on Stormfront's site. So shortly after Charlottesville, we brought pressure to bear and got them to finally enforce that agreement, uh, putting Stormfront in the dark for about two months. Another outcome that we're very proud of. <laughs> now, Stormfront is back up through a Canadian host. It's a bit of a game of whack-a-mole, but no doubt we believe that obstructing and making their organizing activity more difficult is uh, something we have to uh, embrace as success in this dark era. Um, and most recently, we were able to institute a major policy change at Facebook. Facebook had maintained an ill-conceived and deeply flawed policy under which white supremacist content was prohibited, but white separatist and white nationalist content was deemed okay. And we know that all of these violent and hateful ideologies are indistinguishable and that Facebook's policy ultimately left a gaping hole that was easily exploited by those seeking to incite violence across the racial violence across the country. Um, just last week, after many, many months of hard work and advocacy by our team, Facebook abandoned this policy. All three of these hateful ideologies are now banned on their site, and we'll be watching very closely in the weeks and months ahead to police how effectively they implement uh, this new policy reform. So we're using every tool in our arsenal as civil rights lawyers to fight back and hold white supremacists accountable. But no doubt we need the federal government to do its part. And today, sadly, the national climate is one that fuels the fire of hatred that we see today. The Trump administration has reversed important progress that had been made to protect our most vulnerable communities. The administration has nominated individuals to federal courts who bring track records that raise grave concerns about their ability to be uh, fair and impartial in their interpretation of the law. But we've also seen nominees who have track records that reflect hate. Um, we've had one nominee who's blogged support for the KKK. We've had another nominee who said that transgender children are Satan's children. Alleged statements describing African and Caribbean nations as um, expletive uh, countries has contributed to a culture of hate and animus towards black and brown people. By abandoning full enforcement of our federal civil rights laws, this Justice Department sends a dangerous message that the rights of minority communities simply don't matter. We've had the Muslim ban, proposals to close the southern border, all of these policies, practices, and rhetoric matter uh, and feed into a culture of animus um, that black and brown communities face today. In addition, under the Trump administration, we've seen the FBI create, quote, the black identity extremist designation, which criminalizes black activists and groups that are working to hold police accountable. Um, their decision to invent this black identity extremism designation harkens back to some of the worst times for the Bureau. Um, and in particular, it's a throwback to the 1960s when the FBI, led by J. Edgar Hoover, demonized civil rights le leaders who were daring to fight for equal justice, including the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Policies, practices, and rhetoric matter. It's critical that we think about the prescription for addressing the scourge of white supremacy that we face today. Academics have an important role to play in this fight. I'll tell you that Facebook relied on Wikipedia to arrive at that flawed policy that I described, and we directed their attention to leading experts to help educate them on what white nationalism and white separatism mean uh, today. We're going to continue to use aggressive lawyering strategies to move our country in the right direction. We need a Justice Department that's willing to stand up and make fighting hate crimes a priority. 
We need an attorney general willing to use his or her bully pulpit to speak out um, and, and uh, work to hold white supremacists accountable. We also need a Congress to adopt new modern day legislation that can help us fight back. Congress must study and consider new laws for combating the online white supremacist threat. That's probably the biggest void that we face right now. Um, we live in a world where we have some federal civil rights laws that have long provided protection for um, communities of color seeking to access hotels and restaurants. Uh, these are our arsenal of public accommodation laws that ensure equal access regardless of race. But in a world where so much commerce activity now happens and plays out online, it's important for Congress to think about how we extend those civil rights protections to the online public square. Um, just yesterday, I testified, um, as noted earlier, at a hearing before the House Judiciary Committee on um, white nationalism and the rise in hate crimes. It's quite sad in 2019 that we need a Congress hearing focused on an issue like this. I'm glad that they um, turned attention to this. But at some point in the middle of the hearing, um, they had to pull down one of the official online streams of the hearing because white supremacists were um, posting such horrendous and horrific uh, comments. Uh, so they, they literally had to pull that down. Um, Congress has an important role to play here, no doubt. We also have to think about the banks that facilitate commercial transactions for white nationalists, the tech companies that provide open platforms, the web hosts that prop these sites up. All of these entities are part of an economic infrastructure that feeds hate that must be dismantled. At the Lawyers Committee, as we carry out our work, we're inspired by the strength and courage of survivors and we'll continue to fight for a world in which no one is forced to endure such immeasurable pain. White nationalism should be of profound concern to all Americans because these impacts have, have effects not just on individuals but on entire communities and they are tearing at the fabric of our nation. I'll, clo I'll close by quoting um, Dr. Martin Luther King, um, who we lost 51 years ago last week, who observed that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Thank you. All right, is it all on? Is all on? So I think we're gonna, um, have a Q and A now, so please, uh, we'll we'll take a seat. So uh, uh, I don't know if you started to have some question, but I will um, I will start maybe with a with a question. Um, everything that you just mentioned here about the fight in in relation with the law. Um, uh, last November, we had the privilege to have Moa Suman, who came on campus, and she is the one who, the, the filmmaker who produced the uh, Aryans in 2014. And she mentioned in, um, in the discussion that um, in her work, she interacted with uh, radical groups, so she went to meet with people. Um, and, and she said that it's, it's an important thing to also to try to shut them down or to make a, a change in terms of their action. Um, I was wondering, what do you think about her comments in that regard? Well, um, I don't believe that we should write off segments of our society. We're all here and we've got to figure out a path forward. I'll just say another word about the settlement that we secured in our case on behalf of Taylor Dumpson the former American University student. It's very much an agreement that is inspired by principles of restorative justice. Um, and it is a groundbreaking settlement that we think might inform other strategies for dealing with white supremacists. And it's one that really requires um, hope and, um, and required that we um, be creative in imagining mm -hmm. about how we address um, this particular white supremacist by uh, requiring that he um, renounce publicly white supremacy 
um, uh, you know, take community service. He also could take classes on racial justice. Mm -hmm. We're very much hoping that we can reform, you know, reform and reprogram uh, him. So I think that engagement is important, um, and that sadly we are in a world that has become incredibly polarized, mm -hmm. uh, where we don't have a lot of dialogue. Um, we don't have a lot of dialogue across racial lines, across political lines, mm -hmm. and I think that that is dangerous. Um, so I, I think it is a healthy thing and has to be a part of a strategy um, if we're going to combat the crisis that we're up against. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will take now some <coughs> question because I'm sure um, we have a lot. Um, okay, I'm just gonna start. So the first one is in relation to the funding of your organization uh, in terms of public or private funding, if you can tell us a little bit, um, how does it work? Sure. So we're a nonpartisan civil rights organization that um, really turns to support from the public to carry out our work uh, and support from foundations mm -hmm. as well. And I can tell you we're in an era where uh, we're stretched thin and firing on all cylinders. So um, it's through the generosity of the public that mm -hmm. um, we're able to carry out our fight. Our project to combat um, hate crimes is a one of a kind. There are not a lot of civil rights organizations in this space. Um, I did meet um, a, a, a former um, a, a member of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. We have the Southern Poverty Law Center. Mm -hmm. um, but we are uh, just about the only racial justice organization doing and tackling hate crimes work on a national level. And uh, without public support, uh, we would not mm -hmm. be able to do our work. Okay, great. So now another question. How effective will a court settlement with the in actually changing a white power activist mind versus just forcing him to say anti-racist things for a while to keep himself out of deeper legal trouble? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I think that um, we are hopeful um, that the settlement that we secured will, will, will prove effective. Most importantly for our client, mm -hmm. um, she feels good about it. And we carry out our work in a way that's driven by the interests of our clients and the communities that we serve. Um, I hear skepticism in that question and mm -hmm. I think that, that, um, that that's reasonable. And um, you know, as I started to note, in an ideal world we would have prosecutors who had the political will to fully investigate and hold all of these perpetrators accountable. As civil rights lawyers, we're using what tools we have in our arsenal, what limited tools we have in our arsenal to do work that um, might have impact. Um, we think that restorative justice is one path forward um, with white supremacists and white nationalists, and we'll be monitoring very carefully and sharing with the public the results of this important work. But sitting back and doing nothing, I think, is not yeah. an option. <laughs> and waiting uh, for prosecutors to kind of garner that political will is also not an option. Mm -hmm. uh, another question. When confronting anti-Semitism, do you believe it is most effective to treat it as a general um, xenophobic, or do you believe that it is something different about uh, the nature of anti-Semitism in, in terms of maybe xenophobia, racism, um, yes. And how do you frame, I guess the question is, how do you frame the different kind of hate speeches and actions, yeah. and ideology? Yeah, I mean, these are, these are all profoundly dangerous ideologies. When we encounter anti-Semitism in our work, we partner with sister organizations like the ADL uh, mm -hmm. to take action, but um, we think that all hate, all forms of hate, stand as a threat to our democracy. And so through our state Stop Hate project, we seek to provide relief and support for all communities that call and report hate incidents to us. Mm -hmm. Interesting question about um, your, uh, your attitude towards um, reparations. So what is, what is your, maybe in terms of your institution and your personal, um, yeah, 
speaking about. You know, it's been very interesting to see the kind of resurgence of reparations as a, a topic that people are paying attention to. I know that um, um, there are members of Congress who every year consistently push forth a mm -hmm. bill to encourage a federal study and examination of reparations. Um, and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge and applaud Georgetown University for the work that it's done to unearth its history here in a very public way and the steps that the university has taken to um, commit to um, connecting with uh, families and uh, promoting discussion about race and promoting open dialogue about how slavery has benefited mm -hmm. the university. I think. Um, it's important that all institutions engage in this work, and it's not something that we see every day or see at many institutions across our country. In short, I support um, uh, undertaking robust study and examination about um, how we understand the devastating impact that slavery had on our country mm -hmm. and the legacy um, you know, of that dark history on our country today. I think it's important that we unearth the history underlying how institutions have benefited and continue to benefit uh, you know, from slavery today. And to me, those are important steps that might better inform how a society might approach reparations. Mm -hmm. So maybe to add on this, the, my personal uh, question, because you were mentioning collaboration also with the institution and university. So can you tell us a little bit about the different techniques or work that you're doing uh, with your organization? Sure. So we are a wholesale civil rights and racial justice organization. Beyond the hate crimes crisis, we're also tackling other tough issues like voter suppression and fighting to ensure that every American has the right to vote mm -hmm. and have their voice heard regardless of race. Um, we run a program called Election Protection. It's the nation's largest nonpartisan voter protection effort, and we help uh, voters all across the country who are seeking to vote mm -hmm. and who are sometimes encountering ugly voter suppression efforts mm -hmm. across the country. It's anchored by a hotline, 866-HOUR-VOTE, and we partner with uh, over 100 local and state organizations and some schools as well, mm -hmm. uh, many who put forth volunteers. Uh, that help us provide that one-on-one -on -one support to voters and would-be voters across the country. We work on criminal justice, fair housing, education, and um, a whole host of issues, but the work that we do to safeguard access to democracy is mm -hmm. really critical and a place where we draw on broad public support. Mm -hmm. So in the morning we had a discussion about recruitment um, within white supremacist groups and we talked a lot about uh, you know teenagers and and how can we prevent uh, the recruitment so I was wondering in your experience did you see also any kind of difference in terms of collaborating with the uh, with the uh, schools or with the university or different category of um, of individual depending on their age how they are receptive if, if there is something different in that matter yeah, that's um, an important question, and I think um, something that we shouldn't leave out of this discussion. I think young people are especially are especially vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, and subject to easy exploitation when it comes to recruitment by white supremacist efforts. We are seeing a spike, no doubt, in the number of hostile organizations that are actively leafletting and re recruiting on campuses, and you know. When we think about the K through 12 context, I think we're seeing some ugly things play out there as well. Less so recruitment, uh, but you know the racial slurs, the outright bullying that um, plays out inside of our nation's public schools is not something to be ignored. Um, I think it's something we don't talk uh, uh, mm -hmm. talk about enough. I think often school officials don't know how to respond and encounter mm -hmm. and, and and confront. Uh, these issues when they happen and, and try to sweep it under the rug and I think that that's something that can be dangerous and play out in very ugly ways mm -hmm. and exacerbate um, exacerbate incidents that have happened um, so so really thinking carefully about how these issues impact students and children is an important part of tackling this crisis mm -hmm. you also mentioned so your wonderful action 
in regards to Facebook. Um, what are the next steps? Because we know that uh, white supremacists are, will always find another way to be on the virtual space. Um, so how do you think about this challenge? So is footstep, uh, Facebook a first step? And then what's coming next? And how yeah. do you envisage the, the future? You're talking a lot about your work in relation with technology and uh, any kind of enterprise. So how do we do we address this issue? You know, we invested a lot of time and capital into pushing Facebook to get to the right place uh, because our hope is that it would have a ripple effect across the tech sector. But we're going after them all, mm -hmm. uh, Amazon, Google. Um, all of these tech platforms have a critical role to play in the fight against hate. And sadly, too many of them um, need to be pushed from mm -hmm. the outside because th these issues truly stand in a blind spot for them. Um, so our work is just underway. And yeah. with respect to Facebook, um, you know, we, we are deeply skeptical. They've now changed the letter of their policy, mm -hmm. but we've got to see how good of a job they do retraining their content moderators um, to do this work. We've got to see um, how the AI uh, yeah. plays out. The artificial intelligence um, is an important part of how they hope to police the space and um, we'll be watching very, very closely to see how good of a job they do. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you in the hearing that I was at yesterday, a Facebook representative was there and you know, kind of made very broad pronouncements. When we get reports, we take them down. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had to pull out examples of pages that were live on Facebook's platform that we had brought to their attention months ago that are actively recruiting white supremacists right now um, these are dangerous sites that are, are, you know, in the category of white supremacism and never should have been there in the mm -hmm. first place. So um, it's going to take a lot of a, a lot of continued work and effort um, mm -hmm. to push them to the right place and to make sure that they're doing the right thing. So, to understand what was the or what was the resistance in that matters, and also why do you think you succeed in this battle? Yeah. Well, why is a good question. Um, as I mentioned, they literally, um, the, the policy and training materials were leaked by a press outlet. And in our investigation, we uncovered that they literally were relying on Wikipedia hmm. to formulate and develop these policy positions. Mm -hmm. But we also know that diversity is an issue throughout the tech sector, um, that we're not seeing um, diverse perspectives and diverse people around the table. Uh, when these policy positions are formulated. Mm -hmm. And so um, pushing to make sure that we promote diversity and inclusion in the tech sector is another kind of component of this fight. Yeah. And is there any other organization involved in the fight that you're leading with the tech industry? Yes. So um, we have a, co a coalition called Change the Terms, where we're working to push the tech sector broadly to um, embrace civil rights principles, be more transparent in how they operate. And that coalition includes groups like Color of Change, mm -hmm. um, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and others. Okay. So m maybe um, a last uh, question or comment in your, um, how do you envisage the, f the future and the next challenge that you want to share uh, with, the, with the audience today? Yeah. So I'll, I'll maybe answer that in a personal way and mm -hmm. uh, you know, just say that I feel very blessed to um, have a career where ev for every day of my career I've been able to focus on civil rights work and promoting racial justice and doing work that benefits those who are um, invisible and without voice and marginalized. Um, I think that these are dark and turbulent times that we face in our country. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a lawyer on my team who just retired after 50 years, spent about 37 of them in the federal government working through many administrations, um, both Republican and Democrat, and um, retired feeling like the, these were indeed the, the darkest times that he had ever faced as a civil rights lawyer. Um, I think that we've got a long road ahead of us. I think that... Um, you know, I'm deeply concerned about what's happening to our courts. 
Um, the courts are um, an important part of what keeps our democracy intact, an important part of um, you know, um, holding the other branches accountable. And we're seeing uh, a lot of judges who are getting confirmed at lightning speed who bring deep, troubling records um, with them. And um, they're securing spots that are for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so as a civil rights lawyer who carries out business in the courts and really requires, rec you know, um, and really has faith in this belief that you can work hard and develop a case and present the facts and present your case to a judge and, and you know, hope for a fair shot, I think the odds of that happening are declining very rapidly in a way that um, is deeply troubling. Um, not just for us as civil rights lawyers, but for our entire country. Um, I think that we all have a role to play. The academics, the civil rights lawyers, uh, the religious leaders, I think all have a role to play at um, this moment. And I think that, you know, once we get through this kind of dark and turbulent time, there's going to be a whole lot of cleanup work hmm. that needs to be done to just get us back to the status quo. So um, I'm in it for the long haul and hope that everybody in this room is in it for the long haul. Um, we got a lot of work that lies ahead. Thank you so much for the great exchange. Thank you. Thank you, very Thank you so much. Um, and if I, and um, if if I may, um, to learn more about our work, you can visit our website mm -hmm. www.lawyerscommittee.org. And if you were so inspired to support our fight, hit that donate button <laughs> and help us uh, carry out our work. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. Um,